Well, hello again, Northridge family. My name is Pastor Chris Geyer, and it's a delight to be back with you. We are continuing our series called Inside into Acts. This is week two, and as we saw in the introduction, we covered a little bit about the author, Luke, and his careful work in this history, recording really the spread of the early church by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the means of Jesus' continuing ministry through the Spirit and through his people as the gospel really spreads from Jerusalem to Judea, uh, to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's really what we saw last week. That was the commission given in 1 8, then the promise uh, of the Holy Spirit that would come on them. So they were told to just wait in Jerusalem, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And we'll see that come to pass in chapter 2 in what is known as Pentecost. Pentecost is when the Spirit comes on the disciples gathered there following Jesus' resurrection, there in the city of Jerusalem. And from that point forward, the gospel would radiate outwards. But where we find ourselves today is really in the between time, between the ascension of Jesus Christ as he returned visibly to heaven and the coming of the Holy Spirit, as I said, in chapter 2. So we'll see just what the disciples' response is, what their instinct is, and what comes to pass in the meantime here between the ascension and Pentecost. So let's look at it. It says in verse 12 that they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, and that's just the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem. And so they come back and they gather in a large upper room, most likely the location of the upper room for the Last Supper. Also in the book of Acts chapter 12 mentioned when Peter, and, uh, when Peter is arrested there, and they are praying for him, and John as well, and they're praying for him there, it's probably the same large upper room. Now it is probable, again, that that upper room belonged to the family of John Mark. His folks owned that large upper room, that facility in the city of Jerusalem. And so it would have been the location of the Last Supper that Jesus shared with his disciples, probably the location here where they're waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and also where they would gather to prayer, a centralized location in the city of Jerusalem. Now, what else do we see? We see in verse 13, all the disciples are gathered there, but I want you to notice what they're doing in verse 14. As I said, what is their instinct? Well, their instinct is they are gathered with one accord and devoting themselves to prayer. And I love this. They're, as I said, in the meantime, but they're not just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. They are actually engaged in heart-to-heart -heart prayer. And prayer to whom? Well, none other than the resurrected and living Lord, who they've just seen ascended, but whom, in a very real sense, they can commune with, even through prayer. The same privilege that we have, even today, with our Lord and Savior, to connect with Him through times of prayer and lay bare our heart and our hopes and our desires and our struggles and our anxieties. He hears us, and he tells us to come to him in prayer. And so that's what the disciples do, and they're doing that. And they're waiting for this revival. And as Ian Bounds said in his treatise on prayer, he says, we don't pray for the work. Prayer is the work. And I think that's important to remember, is the first thing they do is they devote themselves to prayer. Another well-known um, historian who is an expert in the issues of revival spiritual revival through the history of the church. His name is J. Edwin Orr. He said this, No great spiritual awakening has begun anywhere in the world apart from united prayer. Christians persistently praying for revival. And this is exactly what we see the disciples doing. They're gathered together with one accord, one heart, praying together, anticipating the coming of the Spirit. I want to introduce you to one other name that is... Um, Sadly, not as well known as it should be. A man who lived in New York City in the 1850s, his name is Jeremiah Lanfear. And he lived in New York City, as I said, and he decided that there was just a lack of spiritual fervency in the city of New York where he lived. And so he advertised, simply he put up posters, he advertised a prayer meeting at his church down close to Wall Street today in New York City. And that first Wednesday, when he had advertised and promoted this time of gathering to prayer, no one showed up. It was just Jeremiah by himself. The next week, when he did it, he had six men show up. Six. The following week, more than 20. 
The week after that, more than 40. And soon after a month, there were more than 100 people attending. And the numbers continued to climb. And pretty soon, they started prayer meetings all over the city of New York. And pretty soon, it spread from the years 1857 to 1859. Prayer meetings that were going on from coast to coast in the major cities and even in small rural towns. It was a small spiritual revival, if you like, that spread across this land. And it was an estimated a population in 1859 of 30 million people in the United States that more than two million, more than two million were introduced to Jesus Christ, savingly in that, in that period. And it can be traced back to the beginnings of Jeremiah Lanfear and his commitment to pray, and just to ask God to intervene and to bring revival in people's hearts. Well, this is just what we see, too. A detail that's easily missed in verse 14. Who is gathered there with the disciples? Well, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, Mary had always been present in the life and ministry of Jesus. In fact, she was there at the cross, as the Gospel of John tells us, when he was being crucified. But we do see some interesting insights into his brother's reactions to Jesus during his earthly life. There are many passages, Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3, Mark 3, 21, where it says, frankly, they didn't believe. They thought Jesus was out of his mind during his earthly ministry. But an incidental detail that is striking to me is here, who's gathered there with the other disciples in the upper room? None other than Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, who were transformed from skeptics into believers by virtue of the resurrection. It was just undeniable and indisputable, and they become believers that he is, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds me of a quote by John Newton, who was a well-known Christian, the author of the hymn Amazing Grace, and he lived in the 1800s, and he was a former slave trader, and he trafficked humans from Africa to the Spice Islands. And um, that was his life before Christ, before he was converted. And he always felt a tinge of guilt for his previous life. But he understood that God had shown him amazing grace and that he had been forgiven. But one of the things that John Newton says that is profound and has stuck with me, he says about his previous life and about God's ability to reach even the, the, the one who seems so hardened to the gospel and so far off. John Newton had these words. He says that I have never despaired of the salvation of any man since God saved me. What a profound statement. Here's a man that know his own heart and his own resistance to the gospel for many years running from God. And God reached him and penetrated his heart. And he said, you know what? I can't believe that anyone's too far gone since God has saved me. And I hope we all believe that too. And here we see the conversion of even Jesus' brothers to faith. To faith. Another detail I'd like you to notice in verse 16 is that Peter stands up. And what does he say in verse 16? He said, Brothers, Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke. Catch that? Which the Holy Spirit spoke. So the Holy Spirit has inspired Scripture, the psalm that's being quoted, by whom? By the human agency of David, by the mouth of David. And this gives us insight into our view of inspiration and authority of Scripture, that yes, God stands behind every word in the text of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed, and yet God uses His human instruments in their personalities, in their writing styles, and their experiences as they come through in the pages of Scripture. So the Gospel of Luke writes for us, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. John writes for us, and yet he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul writes for us, and yet he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we understand that when Scripture speaks, God speaks, because it's his very words through his human agents. And so this goes to our view of human agency. Yep. 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21 talk about how God carried along his prophets, his messengers, to deliver the exact message and the exact words that he wished to pass down to us. So we have that too. We also see in verse 22, we have this, this mention, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. And as we saw last week, we saw the ascension of Jesus. The ascension of Jesus. Why does this matter for us? Well, 
No resurrection, no ascension, no assurance that Jesus' sacrifice was accepted. If he died and stayed in the grave, then what, what grounds do we have for saying that God the Father accepted his sacrifice for our sins, that we could experience forgiveness? No ascension, no resurrection means no confidence of, ultimately, resurrection bodies. As 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, that just as Christ was raised from the dead as a first fruit, so too we all will be raised from the dead unless the Lord Jesus returns first. So a promise of the hope of the future physical bodily resurrection. And no resurrection and ascension, we see no assurance of Christ pleading for us at the Father's right hand, which the book of Hebrews and Romans chapter 8 tells us is going on right now, that Jesus knows us and that he's praying for us and he's interceding and he's pleading for us. What tremendous promises, what tremendous assurances in all that we see in the gospel of Jesus because he loved us, he died for us, and he lives, and he lives. Now, what else do we see? Well, we see in verse 24, and they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. You know the hearts of all. Well, this is huge too, isn't it? Just as Samuel, the prophet, in 1 Samuel 16, 7 and 8, was told by the Lord, as man looks at the outer appearance, that's not what God first and primarily looks at. God knows the heart. And so here we have the disciples in this setting. They're saying, Lord, you know the heart of the man who must be selected to replace Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, the one who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the one who hung himself and died in the field of Akeldama, the field of blood. And this, it says, is known all over Jerusalem. And so they're looking to the Lord to show who would be this witness, this witness to the resurrection. Look at the qualifications. Somebody who has been with them from the baptism of John and was a witness to his resurrection. So we're looking for this 12th man to complement these apostles as they set out on this, this task of witnessing and testifying to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And again, what's the essential qualification? It is eyewitness. Eyewitness that he was there from the baptism when the voice came from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, to the reality of his resurrection. And so they're going to cast lots. And as Proverbs 16:33 says, the lot is cast, but every decision is from the Lord. And so they trust that the Lord is in this. Now, this brings up an interesting question for us, doesn't it? Does that mean that as we're seeking out major decisions today in the church in our personal life, we should cast lots? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. In the Old Testament, it was certainly sanctioned. I read a Proverbs, and there's plenty of other places in the Old Testament where this certainly did take place. Okay? But for the Spirit-imbued believer today, that is all those who are in Jesus Christ that have the Holy Spirit and have God's written revelation of Scripture, what is normative for us as we seek guidance from God is, number one, His Word. Number two, seeking His will, will by means of prayer and direction or guidance by the Holy Spirit and the counsel of others. And so from this point forward, after Acts chapter 2, there is no instance in which we see those in the church casting lots for a decision from the Lord. No, God simply guides us differently today. And again, how? Well, we have His Word. We have prayer. We have the Spirit directing and guiding us, and we have Christian counsel, which we should depend upon in the body of Christ, the community of faith. We have other brothers and sisters who should be involved in our life, and they're giving counsel and direction at those times when we need others' wisdom. And I'll end where James ends, too. If any of us lacks wisdom, we should ask. Just ask God. James chapter 1 tells us that God delights to give us wisdom. If we seek it from him, if we ask it of him, he will guide and direct us. So I pray God's blessing in your study as you finish out this chapter one of the book of Acts. Thank you.